All right, what I'd like to talk about today is the age of exploration and the Colombian or Grand Exchange. And as a theme that I want to touch out throughout this slideshow, I want to look at the idea of how Europe goes from being what was in the Middle Ages kind of a backwater, when we compare it to, say, what's happening in China at the time, to being really this colonial powerhouse that dominates the world really up until the mid 20th century with the calamity of World War II that destroys the power of United Kingdom and France as colonial empires. So we want to first look at the causes, the motivations, why were the Europeans interested in going out and conquering the world and how were they able to do that? So the old simple phrase that you might hear, and I think it even turns up in the textbook, is gold, God, and glory, the three G's. Nice and easy to remember, helps you write a nice essay with three paragraphs of evidence. Um, you know, it's good. It's okay as a mnemonic device, uh, but it's simplistic. Uh, obviously, Europeans were looking for wealth, and so gold as a symbol of wealth is appropriate. Um, they're not literally looking for gold initially. They're looking for a route, of course, to Asia for the silk and spices and luxury goods that Asia offers that are very desired back in Europe. But uh, obviously, once the Europeans make their way into South and Central America, they discover quite a lot of gold and, and silver. But most of the wealth that actually comes out of the New World is not actually gold and silver. It's sugar, tobacco, things like this, raw materials. Um, the most problematic of these three is the God idea, the idea that Europeans are looking to spread their religion. Certainly, there is genuine religious sentiment among some of the explorers, but I think you do have kind of a hard time justifying their expenses, the, the willingness to, to risk their life, the willingness of backers to, uh, to invest and, and put their prestige on the line for the idea of spreading the gospel. Especially when you look at in the 15th century, most Europeans are Catholic. And so you don't have this idea of the Protestant Reformation spurring Europeans to go out and spread their version of Christianity really until you get into the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, and then the idea of glory, I think there's two elements to this. One is the idea of individual glory. I'll get into that a little bit later when we look at Renaissance humanism and individualism. And then the idea of national glory, the idea that countries, England, France, Spain, uh, the Dutch Republic, that they see a large colonial empire as something they can be proud of and, and something that's a matter of prestige and honor. Um, I want to look at the role that technology plays, in particular uh, new types of ships and navigational instruments, the role of the printing press, and then address the idea of weapons. We think about that a lot, the Europeans having a technological advantage over Native Americans in terms of their weaponry. So I'll look at that for a little bit. Um, the role of the new monarchs as a political factor, pushing Europeans to go out and explore, certainly funding explorers, um, particularly in uh, North and South America. And then the economic factors that play into how and why Europeans are willing and able to go out and, and explore the world and kind of conquer the world the way they do. Um, a stable monetary system that rises in the late Middle Ages into the Renaissance that allows for investment, uh, new investment strategies, uh, banking industry, the insurance industry, these all play a role, and the rising middle class, both as an investment class and as a pool of people who are willing to actually go and settle in the new world and help further the cause of European colonialism. And then finally, we'll look at the social factors of Renaissance humanism, this idea of having an interest in going out and exploring and understanding this new world that the Europeans have, at least in their minds, discovered. So technological innovations, we'll take a look at these first. Um, we have the ship that's portrayed here, known as a caravel. These are large ships. Well, not large from our perspective, but for Europeans back then, if you look closely, you can actually see a couple small figures climbing up the rigging. You can see they're not very large, um, but they can carry quite a lot of cargo. And so if you can get one of these caravels to Asia or the New World, you can fill it with quite a lot of cargo. And even if you send out a small fleet of, say, three ships and only one of them comes back, if it's got a cargo hold filled with goods, you, you might still turn a profit. And so these ships are 
they make it profitable for Europeans to go out and sail across the Atlantic and, and across the Pacific. Um, the design of the ships is also uh, more advanced than earlier ships. They, the rigging and the sail design allows these ships to sail more directly against the wind, not obviously directly with their head right in the wind, but they can kind of zigzag across the wind and cross the ocean even if the wind is not in their favor and the current's not in their favor. They also have a lot of new navigational instruments. The compass, of course, is crucial to determining direction, but they have a way of measuring speed, a rough way of measuring speed by, um, by using a length of knotted rope to, uh, and a timer to see how much of this knotted rope goes out in a certain length of time. They cast it over the stern with a sea anchor at the, the tail end of the rope and see how fast they're going. And they have instruments that can determine their latitude, how far north or south of the equator they might be. And uh, these are, there's a instrument called a cross staff that's used to measure the height of the sun over the horizon at noon time uh, or the North Star uh, in the middle of the night. And this tells them how far north or south of the equator they might be. And there's an instrument called the Astrolab, which does the same thing. It's a little more advanced. The printing press plays a major role, too, in not only just printing uh, maps and uh, books that explain how to use these navigational instruments and charts that can be used to interpret the readings from these instruments, but also uh, advertisements to convince people to come to the New World, descriptions of the New World, that encourage settlers to come over here and investors to invest their money. And then finally, weapons. I'll address that a little bit later. Um, the Europeans do have steel weapons and armor and, of course, firearms, which allow them to, uh, if they come into conflict with the people they encounter, to uh, potentially defeat them. So political factors. Here we see Queen Elizabeth the Great, good Queen Bess. She has so many nicknames. Beloved Queen of England in the mid to late 16th century. And this is a portrait that shows her as the victorious queen having presided over the defeat of the Spanish Armada. You look in the upper left and you see an image of the sea battle where the English fleet defeated the majority of the Spanish fleet in the English Channel. And then on the right, you see what happened to the ships that survived. They had to, because of the prevailing currents and winds, they had to sail uh, all the way around England, Scotland, and Ireland to try and get back to Spain, and they were beset with horrible storms that wiped out the remainder of the fleet. But we see also Queen Elizabeth's hand resting on the globe, very symbolic that she sees herself as the leader of a country that's the up-and-coming naval power. So the new monarchs are very concerned with establishing themselves, uh, particularly once they realize that there are these huge continents in the New World that are essentially ripe for the, the taking. And so particularly the monarchs in Spain and France and England and also the Dutch Republic leaders are very interested in seeing themselves as the new colonial masters and grabbing a piece of the pie. A little later in the year, we'll look at the economic theory of mercantilism, uh, which says that there's a limited amount of wealth in the world as measured by gold and silver and land. And so Countries have to engage in a fierce competition to see who can get the biggest piece of the pie. And so a big piece of that pie was the, called the land in the colonies. And so the new monarchs are definitely uh, interested in spending a fair amount of resources in sending out explorers, claiming land, and um, trying to encourage citizens to go and, and settle in these colonies. And then they, of course, need a large navy to defend the trade routes and defend their merchant ships from privateers, which are essentially pirates that are hired by monarchs to go and plague other countries' ships. And so they need a navy and they need an army and all of this gets very expensive, but uh, they believe it's worth it to have these large colonial empires. And so they're willing to fund explorers and fund colonies and protect them uh, in order to enhance their prestige. And so this is where we get to the glory part of the three Gs. The monarchs are definitely interested in enhancing the prestige and status of their country with uh, large colonial empires. I love this painting. It's from a little bit late in this period. We're talking about it's the late 17th century. This is a detail from the Jan Vermeer painting. It's actually of an astronomer. The globe he's looking at has um, astrological signs and things on it. But I think it does capture this idea of 
curiosity about the world. Certainly in the Renaissance, you have the humanistic movement where people are interested in exploring and understanding the world. I think that's somewhat of a motivation, although to be honest, I think the economic factor is a much more important one in the funding of the age of exploration. You have not only monarchs that are funding the, the explorers and, and settling colonies, but you also have private individuals and companies of individuals. And so you have people using new investment strategies. You've got, of course, wealthy people that are hiring ships and, and starting plantations in the West Indies. They're starting these fantastically profitable sugar plantations. Uh, unfortunately, the sugar cane requires quite a lot of intense labor. And so first the natives of the area are enslaved. And when they are essentially worked to death, uh, then Europeans go to Africa and purchase human beings in Africa to bring across as slaves. Um, for a while, they try to encourage Europeans to come as indentured servants, but they die off so quickly. The word spreads pretty quickly. Europeans are not too willing to go work in the sugarcane plantations. Um, anyway, but these are very profitable businesses, these sugar plantations. And then in, uh, in the, what's now the southeastern United States, there's uh, indigo and uh, rice and, of course, tobacco plantations. And so there's a lot of money to be made. And so you've got the big players that are investing. You have the rise of banking industries. Uh, both France and England by the 18th century have national banks where people can borrow money for investment strategies. Um, but you also have the rise of joint stock companies where small investors can pool a relatively small amount of money for each individual, pool it together, and can send people off. Uh, Plymouth Plantation, for example, the Pilgrims, this was a joint stock business where investors put money into this to supply the colonists and they expected a return uh, for their investment and hope to get a return mostly with raw materials. Um, there's some more kind of exotic hopes for profits. Uh, the Popham colony that's attempted in 1607 in Maine um, brings with them uh, an expert in gems. They're hoping to find rare minerals and gems to send back. And they obviously don't have much luck with that. Um, and after a winter in Maine, they decide they've had enough of that. They go back to, to England, um, where, of course, they do discover there's profit to be made in New England is with timber and uh, cod fishing, sending back salted cod to be sold in Europe for a pretty good profit. Um, so anyway, there's new investment strategies. There's also, by the 18th century, you're starting to get insurance companies. And so people are more willing to invest in a, what's a pretty risky business, um, sending ships into the unknown to see if they can make a profit. But if the ship goes down and they've purchased an insurance policy, then their losses have certainly been cut. And this encourages people to take more risks and, and encourages Europeans to expand very rapidly throughout the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. So one of the things I want you to think about as we go through this class is you know, the idea of who gets the credit. You know, you as a historian, you want to think about the idea, do, do explorers like Christopher Columbus, he's got his holiday, he's got to be important, right? Well, you know, how much would have happened if he had never lived? Would someone have gone west to try and get to Asia? Or was he really uh, unique in having this idea and pushing this idea? You have the great explorers, you have Magellan, and you have Diaz and da Gama finding their way to India. You have the conquistadors conquering these huge empires, the Aztecs and the Incas. So, you know, without some bold adventurer like that, would it have happened? Some people say no. It really did take a unique individual to do this. On the other hand, what about the ordinary people? What about the sailors on Columbus's ships that are willing to do this? What about the, the pilgrims that are willing to come and settle in the New World? How much credit do they deserve? The people that put their lives on the line in these really uncertain um, enterprises. And then finally, the money, uh, the monarchs and the merchants who funded these enterprises. How much credit do they deserve? Without their backing, would any of this have happened? And so this is something that you need to think about as a historian. If you get a question, a free response question on the exam about the motivations or the causes of the age of exploration, this is what you want to kind of chew on a little bit and produce a, an argument, a thesis that shows that you've dug a little bit deeper than just gold, God, and glory, that you're really thinking about who is the, the mover and who is the shaker behind all of this happening, the Europeans going out and, and settling these huge chunks of the world. 
So uh, here's a painting supposedly of Christopher Columbus. We really don't have any images of him that were made during his life, um, but uh, this one was made fairly close to the time period in which he lived. Um, and so this is uh, to illustrate this so-called great man theory of history, just to take that first point from the last slide, the idea that things wouldn't have happened without people like Columbus, uh, that there were certain individuals who really just made things happen. And, and these people put their stamp on history. And um, certainly Columbus did put a stamp on history. And uh, as I say, he has a holiday here in the United States. But some people argue, I've worked with Native Americans who view Christopher Columbus as a horrible villain. And they see Columbus Day as a, as a travesty. Uh, certainly Columbus did some pretty horrific things to the, the people in Hispaniola. And uh, that was pretty typical, unfortunately, of this time period, the Renaissance, to treat conquered people um, pretty roughly. But uh, anyway, it's something to think about. Uh, does he deserve the credit? Would he have, would, would history have been different if he had not made the decisions he did and had the, the ideas that he did? Uh, by the way, the idea of him proving that the world was round when everyone thought it was flat, of course, that's not true. All educated people at that time knew that the world was spherical. The ancient Greeks had posited that and proven it, essentially. Um, no one else really wanted to do what Columbus did because they realized that the world was too big. Uh, on these ships, you could carry about two or three months' worth of supplies. And everybody thought, oh, man, Columbus, you're crazy. You're going to sail out there, and you're going to get in the middle of the ocean, and you're going to die of starvation. And in fact, uh, those people were right. Columbus thought the world was smaller than it was, and he would make his way to Asia within a few months time. And so, of course, Columbus, you know, a few months after he sets out, he sets foot in the Indies. Uh, he thinks he's in India. So of course he calls the people that he meets there Indians and he thinks Cuba is Japan. And he's, he's mistaken and pretty much everyone else realizes pretty quickly that he's discovered new land. He hasn't discovered Asia, although he's determined to believe till the end of his days that he has made his way to Asia. So anyway, he doesn't prove that the world is round. He, he actually uh, is mistaken about the size of the world. If he was um, unlucky enough to find no, if there was no North or South American place, he would have sailed off into the unknown and never been heard from again. Uh, but he was lucky that way. It's good to be lucky. So conflict. Uh, obviously, when people come into contact with one another, there's the possibility of conflict. When things change, people are going to fight over what shape this new world, is, and this new um, power structure is going to take. And so you have three main sources of conflict that result from the, uh, the European exploration. And really all of these result in Europeans increasing their power and within Europe, certain European countries becoming more powerful. We have conflict with natives, conflict with non-European powers, and conflict among European powers. This is a woodcut of the 1622 uprising in Virginia against the English colonies, uh, done by an artist who was not there. And obviously this is very biased in favor of the Europeans, showing the natives as savages attacking Europeans as they're sitting down to dinner or uh, working very peaceably. Um, but uh, certainly you do have conflict uh, in North, South, Central America. Um, and I put here, why did they lose when they outnumbered Europeans? That's, of course, initially the, the first European settlers and, and explorers are badly outnumbered by the natives. But in the long run, of course, Europe is much more densely settled. And one of the reasons the natives lose is there's this seemingly inexhaustible source of Europeans. They just keep coming. You can't stop them. Um, the scientist and historian Jared Diamond has written a, a very famous book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, where he says that Europeans conquer the world because of an accident of geography because of the climate in Europe, because of the, the latitude that Europe lay out and the way the, the land was laid out. It made it easy for ideas and, uh, and also farm animals and plants to go from the Middle East to Europe and made European farmers very, very efficient so that they could uh, not need as many farmers to support a very dense population. So that led Europeans to have quite a lot of uh, explorers, inventors, craftsmen that could advance technology and allow them to have this edge over other people they met. One of the major things that happens, though, um, if you think about the title Guns, Germs, and Steel, is actually the germs part. Um, 
no one knows exactly how many Native Americans were in the Americas when Europeans made contact, but certainly it numbered in the millions. But uh, Europeans unknowingly brought with them diseases that had arisen um, that, that from Europeans' close contact with animals, with farm animals. Uh, most of the major diseases like smallpox come from mutated versions of viruses that, that affected Europeans um, as a result of their contact with farm animals, with you know, living with uh, animals at the barn that's attached right to the house and cleaning out the stalls and drinking milk and eating meat um, from the animals and um, getting these diseases. And of course, many Europeans died, but other Europeans developed resistance. And then they, they bring these diseases and it just wipes out millions of Native Americans. And this is part of the reason why the Spanish were able to conquer the Aztecs and the Incas. And when the pilgrims come to New England, they find huge parts of New England that have been depopulated because of disease that have been brought here by European explorers and fishermen in the preceding years. So conflict with non-European powers. Uh, the Portuguese, of course, actually do get to India. They sail around the coast of Africa and find themselves on the west coast of India. And lo and behold, there's some people already there trading with the Indians. And these are, of course, the Arab traders. All they have to do is sail across the Indian Sea, Indian Ocean, and, uh, and there they are. And so the Portuguese want to replace them, and they want to be the ones to make all the money trading with Indians and, and with the Chinese. And so uh, there's conflict that arises, and the Portuguese win and establish their colonies on the west coast of India. And this foreshadows what happens later on in the 19th century. Um, you know, in the 15th, 16th, 17th century, the Europeans aren't powerful enough to take on the uh, the Chinese and uh, the Japanese. Uh, these are powerful empires of their own and with technology that's equivalent to what the Europeans have and they have resistance to the same diseases that Europeans have. And so they really can't, the Europeans can't challenge them. But once we get to the 19th century, of course, they can because Europeans have gone through the Industrial Revolution and they have a huge technological edge. But that's in the future, but Certainly this uh, age of exploration foreshadows the fact that the Europeans, they've always had their eye on Asia and, uh, and they're interested in taking it. And in the 19th century, they're able to. And conflict among European powers is one of the most significant effects of the age of exploration because you do have the rise of the Atlantic powers. Um, of course, in ancient times, the Mediterranean Sea, literally Medi, Middle, Terra, Earth, the Middle Earth Sea, for all you Tolkien fans out there, um, was the center of European civilization under ancient Rome and really even into the Middle Ages. You think about it, you have the Pope in Rome and you have in the Renaissance happens, uh, originates in northern Italy. Um, but with the discovery of the New World and the building of these colonies and the wealth that flows from these colonies, you have a shift from the Mediterranean as the center of power to the Atlantic as the center of power. And so you have the Atlantic countries, Spain, France, England, and the Dutch Republic, all building colonial empires in the Americas and in Asia and getting tremendously wealthy. And even the tiny little Dutch Republic is able to uh, stand up for a time against France, which has far more people and in theory, should be able to easily crush the Dutch. Um, they're able to get so much wealth, they can build ships, they can hire sailors and, and soldiers. Um, and so there's tremendous conflict that arises. In Spain now, they quickly are eclipsed by France and the Dutch Republic and England. And the Dutch Republic is able to hold their own for a little while, um, partly because one of their major rivals, the, the English, they're busy fighting each other in the English Civil War in the 17th century. Um, and so they're able to hold their own for a little while, but eventually they get eclipsed and uh, France and England emerge as the two major powerhouses. And this really um, sets the stage for the 18th, 19th, even really into the 20th century, where it's just France and England as the two major opponents. Uh, and this equation really doesn't change until the late 19th century with the rise of Germany, which we'll, of course, get into much later in the, in the class. But um, the colonies are a source of wealth, but they're also a, uh, a bone that they can fight over. And a lot of this conflict is around trade routes. 
and colonial empires. And so um, the political, diplomatic, and military history of Europe is not dictated, I would say, entirely by the colonial empires and, and fighting over them, but certainly um, this is a big part of the political, diplomatic, and military life of Europe for several centuries. And of course, trade, as I said, people are fighting over money, they're fighting over the trade routes. So with the realization that uh, there's no Western route to Asia, uh, there's of course the Portuguese that discover the African route to Asia, um, but there's a realization that these there are these giant continents in the way, and for a while the Europeans try to get around them. Uh, this is what Magellan's doing when he sails south of South America, is he's trying to get to, to Asia. And uh, this is what a lot of explorers are doing when they explore Canada. They're trying to sail north of Canada to get to Asia, and they're not successful. I mean, yes, there's a way, the Magellan finds a way, but it's still very long and dangerous and difficult. And so um, Europeans realize that, well, you know, there's these giant continents, let's do something with them. And of course, the Spanish discover these huge resources of gold and silver. Um, but in a sense, it's, it's a curse that they discover this gold and silver because they, they mine all the gold and silver out and they ship it back to Spain and they just go on this crazy spending spree, but they buy, they build cathedrals and they uh, build up their military power and they use their money to try and defeat the Protestants in the Thirty Years' War. And they, they get all this money and it just flows right through their hands. And in the meantime, um, you have terrible inflation in Spain because whenever you have more of something in any given economy, it's it's worth less. And so the more silver and gold gets into the economy in Spain, the, the less it's worth. And it really ruins a lot of the, the middle class in Spain and, and actually in the long run kind of cripples their economy. Um, but where true wealth is discovered is with the raw materials, as I mentioned earlier, the, the sugar plantations, the tobacco, the rice, the, the fish and the timber, uh, all of these goods that are being produced in the new world and sent back to the old world, so back, sent back to Europe, uh, is creating quite a lot of wealth for the people in the new world and people back in, in Europe as well. And as I mentioned earlier, you have a shift in the economic center of Europe from being the Mediterranean center to the Atlantic center. And so you have the rise of cities like Paris and London and Amsterdam as the major financial centers in Europe as well as a result of the colonial period. And shifting economic realities, you have, uh, as I say, a, a lot of wealth that gets created and a lot of this wealth is in the hands of the merchant class. And so the nobles are finding themselves the old money, the old way of defining wealth as being land and castles and manor houses and um, peasants working on the, the land and paying rents. They're finding that these nobles are, are being left behind and the new wealth is centered in a new class of people, the urban class, the upper middle class and the wealthy merchants. And these are people that throw their weight behind the monarchs because they want a powerful navy to protect their trade routes and a powerful army to protect their colonial uh, ventures and possessions. And so um, the king can tax them more easily because they do their, their interactions with money, which is easier to tax and control than the land. And so they're shifting economic realities, social realities, political realities that result from the opening of the colonial possessions to different people and a different way of defining wealth and creating wealth. This is huge, the Grand Exchange. I think a few years ago there was a free response question about it, sometimes called the Columbian Exchange. Um, and this is the exchange of goods and ideas and technologies back and forth across the Atlantic Sea. So from the old world, from Europe and Asia, you have basically almost anything you can think of associated with a farm today, with the exception of corn and uh, some wildfowl, ducks and geese and turkeys. Pretty much everything else is actually coming from the old world to the new world. So you have, um, you have uh, wheat, oats, rye, barley, horses, not native to the new world, pigs, you have cows and chickens 
all of that coming and Europeans are bringing their European ways of farming, of clearing land, large forests are cut down to make way for, for farms, um, technology, and obviously people, people coming both of their own free will and enslaved people coming from the old world. And also, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of old world diseases. And so the new world is radically transformed. The environment is transformed. The Europeans have a very different way of living than the people who were here before. And it's not that the Native Americans never touched the earth and lived in perfect harmony. No, they, they would do controlled burns and uh, they would uh, farm and, and harvest shellfish and hunt and they would change the land and they would fight over it. But it, it certainly was a smaller footprint than what the Europeans did when they got here. Um, from the New World, you do have luxury items, as I mentioned, not necessarily helpful. Uh, tobacco, some people at the time realized that tobacco was really kind of a noxious uh, thing, but of course people got addicted and, uh, and it was very profitable. Um, sugar, again, not very good for European health. Um, European archaeologists can look at skeletal remains and determine whether someone is from before the contact with the New World or after. They can look at their teeth because European teeth get in really rough shape once sugar gets cheaper and more easily accessible. Um, and food staples, as I mentioned, corn and also the other big one is potatoes are a New World crop. Um, at first, Europeans thought they were actually poisonous. Uh, but quickly they realized that they're actually, uh, they can be grown in really poor soil, like in, in Ireland. Um, they can be grown in really rough conditions and can produce quite a lot of nutrition per acre compared to other food staples. And so in places like uh, Central Europe, Russia, um, Ireland, people find that uh, these potatoes are can support an even higher population density than ever before. Of course, in Ireland, it leads to tragedy because the Irish become over-dependent on potatoes. And then in the mid-19th century, there's a virus that affects the potato crop and causes massive starvation. But this has a huge impact on both the old world and new world, this exchange of goods and ideas and technology back and forth. And as I say, it's known as the Columbian Exchange or the Grand Exchange. So uh, finally, I just have a little credit here. When I have you guys do slideshows or, or uh, papers and things like that, I would like you to track your resources and try to use EasyBib or some other way to uh, let me know where you got your images or your information or your ideas. And so I'm trying to model that for you here. So again, if you have any questions about anything that you've seen on the slideshow here today, uh, please contact me and I will try to get back to you as quick, I will get back to you as quickly as possible and try and clarify things for you. So thanks very much.